sorry, just a second. Thank you uh, and good morning everyone in the United States and good evening in Europe and good night in India, wherever you're listening from. Uh, we have an amazing session today called Life Lived Well and we have two incredible people who are joining us. Uh, and again at Indiaspora, we're happy to also bring this live on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, and so if you have comments over there, uh, we will be answering and taking those questions as well. Again, uh, in diaspora, is pleased to welcome Professor Jagdish Seth and uh, Jay Chowdhury, uh, the CEO of Zscaler this morning. And uh, we're gonna be kind of uh, doing this in two forms. First part, I'm just gonna be moderating a session between the two of them. And then we'll participate with uh, questions from, from the audience as well. Uh, Professor Seth uh, is an amazing individual as you'll find out came here to the US in the 60s, uh, not when he was 60, but in the 1960s, <laughs> uh, and has written over 30 books, uh, authored over 200 papers, is a professor at Emory University, and also the recipient of the uh, Padma Bhushan in India. So welcome to Dr. Jagdish Shet, and, as he's popularly known as Jag. Welcome. Yeah. Thank you so much for inviting. This will be a great session because Jay is with me. Oh, great. And uh, with, with that introduction, Jay, uh, uh, Jay Chowdhury is the CEO of Zscaler. Uh, again, a very successful entrepreneur who has, uh, I believe to date, and maybe he'll correct me, uh, started at least five companies and exited at least all five companies to date. So incredible uh, tech CEO who's moved from Atlanta now to my home area of the Bay. Uh, welcome, Jay. Thank you, Emma. I really appreciate the opportunity and opportunity to talk to our Indian community. Great. Th thank you so much, gentlemen. And I want to first start with your initial experience coming to the U.S. And this is a personal question. So I remember when I came to the U.S. in the 70s, uh, one of the things that I had to do was I landed at JFK with uh, literally nothing in my pocket. And my brother's friend who lived in New Jersey was supposed to meet me at the airport, somehow recognize me and take me to his house. Now, if he hadn't done that. There were no cell phones. There was no phones. <clears throat> I didn't know how to use a pay phone in the US or whatever, right? So that was my initial experience, which was very positive. He found me in this crowd of hundreds yeah. of people, right? Uh, <laughs> and that was great. But then I also had another experience where I was taking a Greyhound bus to go to my college at, in Ohio and uh, one of my boxes with all my pots and pans and spices got stolen. Mm -hmm. And then I saw the warmth of the community at Kent State when my host family went and bought me new pots and pans yeah. uh, the next day and gave it to me, right? So this is the American immigrant experience. So uh, Jag, I'd love for you to share what was it when you first came to the United States <laughs> Uh, and then, Jay, for you to do that as well. What was your initial experience when you came here? Uh, my initial experience was I came by a boat, luxury boat from, mm. I think, Naples. Landed yeah. in New York City Harbor Sunday morning. And, of course, in India, you read newspapers. I grew up in Chennai, even though I'm a Gujarati. And the newspaper habit is strong. 
So I went outside to the vendor and I said, can we give you a newspaper? He gave me a huge pile, Sunday paper, only quarter at that time, but it's, it's like 100 pages or more even. And I thought he gave me the whole bale, whole pile of newspaper. I said, you are making a mistake. I just need one copy. He said, this is the copy pretty much. I carried that newspaper for three weeks because I thought like in India, you recycle things. Somebody will come and pick it up, pay you some money. So that was an interesting experience. I had a similar experience like you have. I could only carry so much weight. 1961 was uh, pretty rare at that time. Not too many Indians were here. So I had my brother ship out everything except he on the box, wrote the prep notion, shirts, or uh, what you call Indian artifacts, you know, handicrafts, etc. whatever is inside the box. And it came to Pittsburgh where I went to study, 1961. And I went to the customs to get my box, this typical crate that we make in India. And I opened it and I found nothing but New Jersey newspapers. So apparently <laughs> everything was stolen completely. Wow. So I was just like yeah. you at the mercy of the community when I came, but great time though. Fantastic. Uh, thanks, Jag. Uh, Jay, how about you? Uh, what was your experience like? Yeah, interesting. I came to the U.S. in 1980, right after doing my bachelor's degree at IIT VHU Varanasi. Uh, thanks to Tara, they gave me um, a scholarship to really buy a plane ticket. Otherwise, it would have been very hard. So I, I minimized the expense of traveling. So I bought a ticket only to JFK rather than Cincinnati, Ohio, where my school was, and say, I optimize it. It's going to cost me less to take a Greyhound bus from there. So I took a Greyhound from JFK to Cincinnati to go to University of Cincinnati. Um, my luggage, actually, when they changed the bus in Columbus, Ohio, I lost my baggage. So when I landed in Cincinnati, there's no luggage. <laughs> <laughs> I, I took a local bus, landed at since University of Cincinnati to find that it was Saturday morning. No one was at camp at the campus. It's like, huh, where do you go now? Uh, so there was a teacher. She was doing research during the summertime. I talked to her. She actually picked me, dropped me at my Sanders Hall. That was the dormitory for students. She came back to pick me up and the luggage came. She took me to the Greyhound station picked on my luggage wow. and brought me back. It was a warm, warm welcome. It, it was very exciting. You know, we, we all three had similar experiences, yeah. but the community really welcomed us, you know, and that's what I think the United States is all about as we know it, right? right? Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's terrific. Uh, now I want to go back to uh, JAG, uh, Professor Shit. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can you, in a couple of minutes, you have such a unique journey in the US, you're still yeah. so active. And I don't want to give your age away, but if you don't mind sharing your age, but also your journey from 1960 <laughs> to 2021, yeah. a 50-year right. span in the United States. Can you quickly yeah. uh, give us a summary of that? Sure. I'm 82. I can share my age. That's okay. And if I look younger than that, it's because I'm in marketing. First thing we <laughs> learn is all about packaging, right? <laughs> so, I mean, it's interesting. I was the only foreign student in a single batch of MBA classes, one year program, uh, not only Indian, but only foreign student. Wow. And it was very interesting. I sat in the front because I'm short. Like in India, you take notes, that's the habit to form. And my encounter was fascinating how my journey began. I had a professor who came out with the idea that in the after World War II, housewives are going to the store, grocery store, without a shopping list, and therefore they are impulsive buyers. Now that did not connect with me. This is the advantage of coming from a different culture, different perspective, different experiences. I never talked back to the professor. I mean, that's not the nature of how we are trained in India. Mm -hmm. I finally raised my hand, something happened, and I said, does this mean, professor, that all illiterate societies are impulse buyers? He was stunned. Students want an argument between the student and the professor. I didn't want any argument. After 20 seconds, he finally says, it's a good question. Let's talk about it later on. Now, he was so generous. He became my mentor. He nurtured me. He and I wrote the first book in 1969 we published. Mm -hmm. He took me to, which is a classic, by the way, called The Theory of Buyer Behavior. 
why people become loyal to brands or products. And then he and I went together to Columbia University. It's absolutely the, 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 the clear, real sign of a person is actually learn from everybody. So he said, I don't know about the cultures. I can learn from you. That was the generosity and then the true scholarship of a person. I went to Columbia University and from there I went to MIT because MIT was the first institute to start the first IIM Calcutta before IIM Ahmedabad was created, which was a Harvard joint venture, four foundation funded. So my view was that I will teach one semester in Cambridge, one semester in Kolkata. And it didn't happen because within a year I came back to Columbia to finish a major research project with John Howard, who was my mentor. We went together as a package. And then I went to University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, very different. But I knew that in a large metro area, raising an immigrant family with children, children may have some reactions by people because they don't know our culture. So I intentionally went to a campus town, which usually are more liberal. There are more foreign faculty, foreign students. And then that was exactly what happened. We had a great time, Champaign, Illinois. But in the Midwest, when you are in the Midwest with bitter winter, et cetera, you get a midlife crisis sooner than you think. <laughs> so, so I went to California. Where do you go to recall your midlife crisis? I went to California at University of Southern California, started a center for the telephone industry where I was very actively involved in advising the management, and then came to Emory University in 1991 by primarily being a professor and starting a different center than the telecom center over here. So that's the background pretty much. Fantastic. What, what a journey. 30 books, 200 papers, still active at age 82, teaching, commendable. And we all want to be like you when we grow up, uh, Professor <laughs> Shed. <laughs> and uh, Jay, coming over to you, can you top that one? <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> I came to the U.S. to do my master's. That's the only way you could come unless you had a close blood relations. If your brother and sister took forever. So that's the only way I came. I got my master's. It's interesting, my background. Uh, after doing my double in computer science, I thought it'll be good for me to do uh, MBA. Okay, but a professor who knew me from industrial engineering and management, he said, no, 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 you do master's in industrial engineering and management, and you do research work for me, and I'll give you research scholarship. Wow. And I said, great. So I had joined a full-time job at a, a startup in Cincinnati doing some software development. Uh, then I found that to get research scholarship, I had to be a full-time student. So I joined full-time masters. I got free tuition, free research scholarship. I just had to work a little bit extra hard on weekends and evenings. It worked. Then I eventually, I did MBA and the small software company started to take me to demonstrate demonstrations of the healthcare management and financial system we have built. That's when I discovered that I had more fun meeting people and, and engaging with them than writing code in front of a terminal. So that's what took me to say, huh, let's try a job in a good computer company. And I said, what's one of the best companies, IBM? So I applied for a sales role at IBM. They hired me. And that's where I moved from my engineering background to sales background. IBM was the best training ground. And I think the combination of my sales experience, but roots and training and engineering was extremely helpful for me to do a number of these startups. Fantastic. And, and I think uh, then you moved to Atlanta, I think, right? And I did. I did. So Atlanta was, so IBM, then from there, I moved to NCR to do international marketing. And from there, uh, Unisys hired me as VP of sales and marketing for their software products. And then a small public company in Atlanta for query and reporting tools hired me as the number two man. This was a small public company. And from there in mid nineties, when I was reading about Netscape, Mozilla browser, World Wide Web, I fell in love with this new technology. I read everything I could about it. And I could say, wow, I should be doing a startup too. 
So there's no DNA of entrepreneurship in my family. They were small scale farmers, but I always had a love for learning, reading, figuring things out. Mm -hmm. So that led me to the first security startup, Secure IT in Atlanta. Uh, my, the, my biggest break came when I failed to raise VC funding in Atlanta and my wife kind of said, okay, I'll support you. Let's put our life savings on the line. The biggest and the best gamble of our lives. And that company became successful. I was able to combine my sales and marketing skills. I learned at IBM and others with my technical background to really do a good job. The company got acquired by Verisign. So my most satisfying thing at that time was, you know, in, in the dot-com time, very same stock went to the roof. We sold the company for $26 per share. And when I left after 18 months, it was 256 after two splits. So 70, 70 of my 80 employees were millionaires. So in Atlanta, there's a lot of buzz around the success at a time. I thought it was a fluke that it happened so fast, so well. So I wanted to prove that I can do it again. So this time I said, let's do a startup. And I said, I can only put so much money in one startup. So I did three of them, uh, but stagger them just like having kids. You stagger them a year or two apart. All the, those three companies became successful, eventually got sold like most startups. Fast forward to 2007, 2008. No, I didn't want to do a startup and sell it. I want to do something big, something lasting. And that's where Zscaler was born to be the cloud security company. And we have been lucky. We have a great team. We have done quite well. Fantastic. What uh, two amazing journeys uh, that you had. Uh, now I want to come to the relationship you have formed uh, as two friends. Uh, so maybe, uh, uh, Professor Sheth, you can talk about how did you meet Jay? Uh, what was your relationship like? And I would like to hear both sides of, of this relationship. <laughs> sure. Uh, first of all, Jay is very approachable. He's very humble. He's a great teacher, surprisingly. He did workshops after workshops when he had a company called Core Harbor. We met primarily through Thai Atlanta chapter that he was the organizer. I had gone to San Jose, the main Thai event, Thai Khan, as a keynote speaker, 1998 is my memory, uh, where they have uh, CK Prahlad was 97, the next one was always at the management, and he was there. So we met in Atlanta. We both have passion for entrepreneurship, so we got together. And then we just liked each other. So then Jay would uh, mentor, give me some advice, surprisingly, which was very good. I've learned a couple of things that you don't know, but Jay is very, very good. So we have learned from each other quite a lot. Became friendship. He invited me to attend his board meetings. Uh, he invested in one of my little ventures, which hasn't done as well as Zscaler has done, but it's okay. So that's how our relationship began. Very warm relationship. And we still continue interacting with each other. So Fantastic. I think Jack is being just <laughs> too humble. Okay. I'm not sure I can teach anything to Jay. I mean, there's so much to learn from him. True, Thai brought us together. It is interesting that I met many Atlanta uh, leaders in IT or entrepreneurship in through Thai <laughs> Global when we had the event in San Jose. Uh, it's very interesting. But when we met, I think soon I discovered Jack's book called The Rule of Three. <laughs> okay. Right. I mean, I must have read that book about five times. It's like, it was fascinating. It's written, what, Jack, 99, 2000 timeframe? When was it written? Yeah, it, it came out around 2003, but okay. I was talking about it, right? Yeah, around that time. Yeah, fascinating book. Any of you who are interested in entrepreneurship should read that book because I have followed that book very carefully. And then some of these discussions that, I would have a jag about the macroeconomic situations. Which country will move where? What will happen to Asia, Pac, China, Australia, America? Th those are fascinating discussions for me. So I was impressed. So that's why I had Jack join my board and it was wonderful. I think it's also being humble, so learned, knew so well. So it, it was it was always fun to get to meet Jag and learn from him. Uh, I, wouldn't, I won't say I 
I, I really taught him anything. He just <laughs> being humble, but I, I learned a lot. <laughs> no, that, there's a very true. good, uh, yeah. There's a very good saying, which I think is so profound. I latch on to that saying, when the student is ready, the teacher will show up. <laughs> and <laughs> and you can learn you can learn from anybody. You can learn from your peers. You can learn from your subordinates. You can learn from children. You can learn from mountains. You can learn from nature. It's a very profound saying. So it's yep. the receptivity of learning, obsession yep. to know, learn, which is what Jay has always. And I have the right. similar one. So there's another common DNA that we did not know. Both of us are just obsessed to learn newer things, do something different, etc. cetera. No, that, that's terrific. We have a, uh, someone from Facebook, Rana Pratap says, even my experience 20 years ago in 2001 was similar to Jay's in uh, 1980. So a lot of similar experiences coming from our, our community. Uh, now uh, I want to move on, Professor Sheth, to uh, some of the books uh, you've done and, and uh, this curiosity that you have for learning and, and writing. Uh, yeah. So uh, you, you wrote a book called The Accidental Scholar, I think, or Accidental yes. Professor. Can you talk a little <laughs> bit about because that resonated with me as I was uh, reading through that one. Right. Basically, I was not supposed to be in the academic world. It's an autobiography. I was born in Burma, 1938, before uh, World War II. Japan was rolling over all of Southeast Asia. Ultimate destination was India, because India was a land of honey and milk and all that stuff. And uh, we were in Burma. My father was a merchant. He went to Burma in 1916. British had divided the total British empire into two empires. Calcutta will manage now West Asia, which is Middle East. And then Rangoon, Myanmar was created. Rangoon as a capital, Yangon as it is called, where they invited lots of Indians to come, both bureaucrats, bookkeeping, accounting, legal, you no know, red tape essentially, but also merchant community. Burma was the largest rice producing nation in the world at that time, very rich land. Wow. Very good people. Incredible. So we were born there. He brought his two brothers and his cousin brother, four families. And of course, when the time came to leave, he did not want to leave. So we left, finally became refugees, like all refugees, lost everything, came back to Kutch, where I am from originally, within Gujarat. I would not be literate even, no high school education. I'll be probably managing the family shop, earning about maybe... 10,000 rupees in today's calculation per month, I'll be very happy. I learned quite a lot that when dislocations happen, if you survive, it, it builds a character. There's an inner strength yeah. that keeps you going. And that's what happened. So we moved around. Ultimately, we settled in Chennai. Now, those of us who know India, South India is very different than North India or Western India. But that gave me a chance to learn English. I began to think in English at age 14, if I was in Gujarat, I'll be mostly talking in Gujarati, maybe Hindi at best. And that's clearly the journey. And then when I came here, that professor is the one. Actually, there was another person who I never met. We used to correspond. Maslow was a psychologist, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Right. I fell in love with that theory because I wanted to know motivation of people. So I changed my major to behavioral sciences. And I corresponded with him. I took his theory from the individual to the nations. Hmm. So my view was that if religion is an institution, at the safety survival level, only thing that appeals to the masses is to say, God will protect you. God loves you has no meaning. Once protection is given by unions or by government policy, hmm. you move on to the next one. Now you must say, God loves you. But once love and Affection is satisfied, you have to change God now, actually your self-independence. God is for you, God is with you, and ultimately you are the God. That's a radical thought, which basically says that the people born in a religion probably will not continue living in the religion. <clears throat> they will find identity some other place. I did that for business institutions, for actually employment side, did it for religion, did it for, in fact, government, where why some countries appeal communism versus others believe in capitalism. And it just took off very well. So that's really the start. But as Jay mentioned, 
the real books I have written, which have had more impact, are about three, four. And I'll quickly summarize and give time to Jay. Rule of three clearly is one. There is a second book I came out later on called The Self-Destructive Habits of Good Companies. Why Good Companies Fail. Absolutely incredible. Most insightful question I've been asked by a chairman in a one-on-one -on -one coaching was that question. And I did all the research pretty much. And I found out good companies have seven bad habits. And that has gone to 14 languages easily. At the same time, a colleague of mine, Raj Sisodia, and I wrote a book called Forms of Endearment, which has led to conscious capitalism movement. And the th one more book that has made a huge impact on people reading, as well as academic world, is called The Clients for Life. How to Become Trusted Advisor. With automation so much taking place, you don't need all the routine work that senior professional people do like lawyers, accountants. So how do you go from an expert to becoming a trusted advisor? And that's the journey I still continue. I enjoy learning new things. So I take a chance to write new stuff, learn myself, have my research assistants teach. That's what I do and keeps me going. Fantastic. Fantastic, Jag. I'm glad you came to my hometown of Chennai. I still detect a tinge of that Chennai accent in your speaking. <laughs> Thank you. But, Thank you. So Thank you. But uh, Jay, uh, back back to you. Um, you know uh, this love of learning that uh, Professor Sheth has. Uh, mm -hmm. You seem to have a similar thing of exploring new Absolutely. things and trying new things. Talk <clears throat> talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, you know I don't know where it came from because my parents were small scale farmers. But since my parents had never gotten an opportunity to go to school, they wanted to make sure I could go to school. It was a village school, right? I mean, decent, but I, I have luckily come across people who cared about me. There's a high school headmaster who really helped me. He saw some talent, but I somehow loved to learn every book I could find I recall my high school had a small library, literally three Almiraz of books, period. That's it. <laughs> I somehow, I managed to read every book in those three things. It was somehow the love for learning. And that's really what has taken me from next to the next to the next level. I mean, besides engineering, I think Indians had done very good in engineering overall. I think if there's one thing I can share with you, go beyond engineering, expand yeah. your horizon because engineering is wonderful. But if you become a little bit more business person, I mean, that's what IBM did for me to expand my horizon from <coughs> engineering <coughs> to really looking at the business and the sales, dealing with CIOs and the like. Mm -hmm. uh, it was wonderful. Now I actually see Indians doing so well across the whole mm -hmm. thing. Uh, in mid nineties, you, you looked for CEOs in America. There's hardly any. Conval Reiki had this company that got sold to Novell. I mean, he was one of the early Indian CEOs I've seen. Now Indian CEOs are doing so well across the board. So that the, the maybe not the stigma, but the being putting Indians in engineering bucket only is no longer good. Now at Zscaler, I deal with so many CIOs, CTOs, CISOs, CISOs are head of security. It's fascinating. Today, if I talk to 10 C-level in IT at random in large companies, about four of them would be Indian. Okay, but 10 years ago, it would be hard to see one Indian right. among 10 C-level you talk to. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating transformation and they're doing very well. I think they expanded the horizon and very well. If you compare that to in the Chinese community, I mean, in the US, they've done well. But when it comes to actually having a broader impact at the level, I think Indian's community has done very well. And I think that's because they go just beyond being essentially technical leaders. They're broadening the horizon and it's wonderful. 20, 30 years ago, Indians will come to do two things, either professors or engineers. <laughs> right? Now they're all over. So I would say, you know, learning from each other, keeping an open mind to say, there's a new way of doing it. There's a better way of doing it. 
what has helped me is kind of challenge the way things are done today. Every company I have started was never a me too company. It was never said, oh, this is a hot area. Let's start a company. If an area is hot, you're too late. Okay. Yeah. In fact, many times uh, these smart VCs run after pouring money once something gets hot. It's too late. In fact, I like to say you should go after first mover advantage. And if you can find IDC data for a certain area, it's not first mover. Right? Secure IT was actually the first pure play security services company I know of in the country because there's nobody out there. You figure things out. When I started Zscaler, people kind of wonder, gee, uh, how did you have the vision to do it? You know, most of the stuff is fairly simple, common sense, especially if you're exposure to a given domain. When I started Zscaler, I asked myself only four simple questions. One, internet was the big source of information. Will there be bigger, will it become a bigger source of information? Who could say no? Number hmm. two, I have been using Salesforce and NetSuite in all of my startups since year 2001. I had convictions about SaaS companies. Will more companies become SaaS? Of course, I had the full conviction. Number three was, we were mobile 10 years ago. Laptops are widely used. Trio, BlackBerry, and iPhone was just announced to the big screen. Will we become more mobile? Of course we will. And the fourth and most important question was, if more and more business happens on the internet, in the cloud, will there be need for security? Well, internet has in the wild west, every bad thing has come from there. Every good thing has leaked out to there. So of course, if more business happens on the internet, there'll be more bad guys trying to take a piece of action without working hard. So with that, I said, where should security be done? It should be done in the cloud. A new idea, but simple common sense idea. And the second thing we did was, let's not take shortcuts. Let's not build something that's 20% better than what's out there today. Because the big old companies will catch up. Let's think about building something that 10x faster, 10x better. It's just disruptive. So I'm a big fan of disruptive technologies, just changing the way things are done because they give you enough runway to build a strong business and keep on learning and keep on disrupting yourself. You know, I ask myself every day, it's like, it takes different kind of leadership to take a company from zero to 10 million, 10 to 100, 100 to 500, and so on and so forth. So you need to question and challenge and say, how do I need to change to run a billion dollar company versus a hundred million dollar company? And you can apply the same thing in any aspect of life. So I think reinventing, changing, learning, questioning yourself is a good thing. One last comment I'll make, if you think the biggest thing I think I learned in my life is to really be self-confident and self-critical at the same time. Okay. Mm. If you're self-critical, you could lose your confidence. Okay. But you could be self-confident and self-critical. Without being self-critical, it's hard to improve yourself. So terrific. Uh Jay, yeah, wow. great words of wisdom, self-confidence and self-critical, being simultaneously doing that, right? Also, your thought, your uh, observations on Indians, you know, where we are learning continually and so forth. When you look at our own community, just for a minute, the Indian American community is 1% of the U.S., right? But we are 7% of the doctors. We are 10% of the IT workforce and the IT technology area, yeah. right? So we have unfair mind share in many of these. We are probably, you know, 10% of the professors, like a professor said. When you go to any university, any department, there's so many Indian American professors, right? So I think all this is, is, is going on as well in our community yeah. uh, as we speak. And that's why one of the things we are uh, doing at Indiaspora, just to give you some a pre announcement. There's a book coming out on the Indian diaspora, the Indian American diaspora yeah. in May. And Indian diaspora has been part of that, where we are chronicling in 12 chapters the mm -hmm. journey of Indian Americans over the past 40, 50 years across technology, healthcare, uh, politics, business, philanthropy, and so forth. So I mm -hmm. think it's, it's 
the time uh, that we kind of distill all this and communicate this uh, to the greater American community, right? Yeah, Emma, if yeah. I may say, the work you're doing is commendable to bring it all together. Sometimes uh, we look at the Jewish community, look at how much impact Jewish community has done. It's, it's amazing, right? We probably, we all get busy because we have full-time jobs, but I think figuring out somehow to really leverage all these connections is a very good thing. Thank you. And uh, Professor Shet, the question from Rajesh Shetty on YouTube, what yes. new opportunities do you see most people are not seeing? Uh, when you're creating a new category, what are the key challenges that come along with it? And both of you can take this uh, second yeah. part, but you know, go ahead, Professor. Mm, sure. Uh, the first one really is uh, in emerging markets more so, although it may be in the advanced economies, mm -hmm. the consumption in emerging markets like India, more than 60% is unbranded products. And if therefore one can take a street food from any street, any place in India, and there are thousands and thousands of unique recipes. One can take that recipe and scale it up as a manufactured brand. Branding, scaling, you become a multimillionaire overnight. Here are the examples, Haldi Ram in India. Deep foods out of New Jersey, started with a chevro, the wife made a great Patel family chevro, and the rest is history, they commercialized it. Today, it is one of the largest consumer products companies in the country. So ultimately, so in many cases, is that one thing that you can do, take unbranded into branded, and if it is unorganized retailing as it is in India or other emerging economies, Africa is the next major continent to rise in the second half of the 21st century, so given the same opportunities will be there, but unorganized, make it organized. And now today it's very possible because of the smartphones, the 5G, 4G networks, for example. So I can create an e-commerce platform for anything. So in India, again, you see FinTech rising, EdTech rising, surprisingly, you see companies like Upgrad out of nowhere have become major company that may be the first unicorn as it gets listed in the Indian IPO, it looks like pretty much. So you can see enormous excitement taking technology, taking what is desi products, making into much more modern contemporary packaged branded products selling through distribution, which is an organized distribution. That's just one, I can go on forever, but I want to make sure Jay has some time and others have some time. Sure, so, so Jay, if you were starting a new company today, what would you do? You know, I would say, it depends upon the, the domain area you come from. I will look for new areas. No, obviously you won't be expert in a new area, but at least some level of adjacent markets where you understand the market to some degree. You know, I have two competing you know, thoughts in my mind about startups. When you want to do really something in a new area, then I say, don't listen to your customers. Don't do what your customers tell you because they're going to ask you for the old stuff. But when you want to improve the new solution, the new the technology you introduce, then you can listen to the customers to incrementally improve those technologies. So when Zscaler was started, there was not a single customer asking me and say, I need security to be done in the cloud. Right. That conviction was built. Now, I did see precedence of it. I mean, Email was done by Sabir Bhatia 10 years ago or whatever years ago before that in the cloud as the first thing. Salesforce, NetSuite were all done in the cloud. If that's the case, then I looked at the whole computing. I saw computing is a natural thing to do in the cloud because doing your own is like a cottage industry. Everything starts with cottage industry. Your power generators used to be at home generators till they became professionally managed power companies. So computing and security should naturally be a utility service run from somewhere in the cloud. So that was the conviction I had. Now, I could validate some of the things with the customers, but I didn't care about validating the technology, the new technology with the customers. And then you go ahead and incrementally improve from there. But one other thing I, I ask people is, 
really when you start a new company, have some level of expertise in the domain or adjacent domains. In the dot-com era, people just starting anything in any area without any understanding. The chance of that failure are pretty high, right? But also when you start a new area, I think people too often think that the startups will make them rich quickly. Okay. I think they often get yeah. disappointed. You should never yeah. do startup for money. You should say, I have a passion to do something and money can follow us if you succeed. And people give up too early. The other thing I tell them is put your own money in the company, whatever money you have, okay, then you are invested into it. If it's too easy to raise money and spend money, you don't, don't really do what really needs to be done. So I have always put my own money in each startup. Oh, that's uh, terrific, uh, Jay. And uh, you rightfully said, everybody looks at Zscaler and thinks it's an overnight success, right? It took you 10 plus years to get to where you're at, right? And you still have another 10 year journey to go, you know, before you're really, really successful, right? So uh, people forget that uh, for the most part. We have a question from one of our Indiaspora members, Gaurav Basin. Gaurav, you want to ask your question? Thanks, Amar. Yeah, hi, nice to meet you, uh, Jay and Jack. So uh, one of the questions I had is, you know, we're starting to see um, a lot of India Indian company becoming more product focused. So, um, so Jay, in particular, where do you see India kind of really becoming a good hub for producing world-class SaaS companies? And number two is, mm -hmm. You know, um, I know your team, uh, Puneet and Brad, I've actually so shown them companies and we sold a security company to IBM last year, as well as uh, one to K1 Capital. Where do you see India kind of playing in the security ecosystem? Do you see world-class <clears throat> quality security companies coming from India? Uh, look, I have been very excited in the past two, three years to see India actually building product companies and SaaS companies. The momentum is picking up. But then if you compare it with Israel, we're not doing very well. But it also tells us that there's a big opportunity for us. I think Indians need to learn from Israel to see how it's such a tiny country can build so many products and sell it. If I were to say at the highest, simplest level, I mean, they learn how to build technology in Israel, but all the business focus is in the US. Now, Indians have that advantage too. Israelis have full connections with US, so do Indians. And I see a number of them really selling products in the US and in Europe. So there are two markets to look at. You build a company to sell things in India. That's one thing. We should be able to do well there. But you build a company to sell at a global level. US is the biggest market. And Europe is the second biggest market. So having strong leadership in US which is probably the easiest market or easiest and the largest market because it's a homogenous market. You really mm. build some success here and we should be able to do very well. So whether it is SaaS companies or security companies, I think India has lots of talent to build, but I think to go global, set your sales and field operations here and build success from here and engage some of the people who have been here, maybe in sales and business engagements and whatnot, engage mm -hmm. with Indian CIOs, CTOs, CISOs. I mean, they always have a little bit soft corner. I hope they do because that's how I feel like. When I was trying to get my break in sales at GE, General Electric, it's funny. I would call all these people and they said, hey, IBM and engineering products, we don't think that's, we think, don't think so. Because IBM was only viewed in the data center. At that time, I had been got, getting frustrated. Nobody was taking my calls at GE for sales. So I found about 250 engineers in a phone book of 20,000 people. And I called everyone so they could talk to me. And finally, a few did. They helped me. It was very good. And I moved on. It, it actually was a big turning point to make me... Um, from a discouraged person to a kind of encouraged person to see that sales can happen. So engage in the US to build a, a global sales organization and but do your products largely in India. It's a great combination at Zscaler. 40% yeah. of my people are in India. 
Fantastic. Yes, thank you. Uh, a couple me of just, things coming up. Uh, me... Sorry, Professor Shed. A couple of things yeah. I want to just bring up. Uh, yeah. From uh, Rahul Biswani on Facebook says, pure wisdom, great learning. We'll read the rule of three. Grateful for sharing it so generously. We also have uh, Rajesh Shetty uh, for Professor Sip that says, your idea on branded, uh, branding unbranded products, such a simple, brilliant idea. Thank you, Professor Shet. Manusha on YouTube says, wonderful right. to hear and see two highly respected leaders share their experiences. So just wanted to, to add some of the comments coming in real time from our community as well. And uh, me Nalini, just... uh, Saligram, one of our members, you have a question for oh. Professor Shet on philanthropy. Oh, yes. Nalini, you want to ask your question? Yeah, no, I was just curious, you know, um, <laughs> yeah. successful people also give. And I was just wondering when um, that turning, what was the turning point for you, uh, for either one of you, actually, and uh, what has motivated you to give? Yeah, in my case, the turning point was <clears throat> reflecting back how much individuals <clears throat> in this country has given back to me especially for my doctoral dissertation, I needed money to do a questionnaire survey. And there were two small amounts of money, $500 each, given by University of Pittsburgh doctoral program. One was from SNH green stamps. Remember in the old days, we licked the stamps, put it on a piece of a booklet, I guess, and went to the supermarket before Groupon and all those things happened. I still remember the generosity and how that small amount of money made all the difference. That was the time when I thought giving back should come, not when you retire, but you are on a journey that you have just begun. Should be a part of your DNA, essentially, giving back while you are earning, giving back while you are contributing, while you are raising family. And that led to the first foundation, which is called the Shut Foundation, only for the academics generating next generation of scholars, doctoral students making into professors, recognizing very well-known scholars who have done a lifelong journey of 40, 50 years contributing back. And that has been a very successful experiment. Thousands of doctoral students worldwide have benefited from that consortium that we organize every year. Then the second one was that living in a community, we as Indians always like to contribute back to India. And I totally agree. There is no better free education I've ever got in my life except in India. At Loyola College, for example, Jain College in Chennai, anyone high school, very strong education. I benefited from that. So giving back to India is given. But we need to think about giving back to local community where we flourish, thrive. So we have a family foundation that goes out of its way to focus on in the communities in Atlanta, for example, communities in cities in this country, which is very fascinating. And so those are the two foundations we have done. My wife is very engaged. She's as passionate as I am. She was a teacher herself before she married me. So we have a very strong belief system of giving back. So that's my journey about giving back. So great. Uh, before I go to Jay, I just want to say, uh, Professor Shet, uh, I. Uh, you know, also went to Loyola College in Chennai, and I think we paid oh. 20 or 30 rupees uh, to go exactly. to that institution. Exactly, exactly. It's just unbelievable. I mean, they repaid nothing literally and got a great education. And that was given by Jesuits, you know, basically, uh, the tradition is very fascinating. I do want to add one thing before Jay talks about in Nalini's question. Mm -hmm. Think about think about that unbranded product to branded Patanjali started by Baba Ramdev. Today, along with one acquisition, is 30,000 crores brand. Highly unorganized sector, which was Ayurvedic medicine. He's already global, by the way. It's fascinating to watch. So while made in India, it's one of the largest. It took maybe 50 years for Unilever, Hindustan liver, to come mm -hmm. up to that level. He's knocking the doors of Hindustan liver, like the number two company in total sales and turnover. And the journey has just begun. So I become more fond of basic products, consumer products. We are finding snack products in India also becoming the same. People love to eat snacks. And so just think about that as a huge opportunity in countries like India. But taking a global view, I think Jay's view is very true. 
many of the Indian products in IT definitely can become global and one can think about the global market and recruit leadership accordingly. Thanks. Jay? Yeah. You know, we're all influenced by the journey we take. Uh, some of the early work I started doing was after the acquisition of Secure IT uh, by VeriSign. Uh, my impressions were a lot of schools in, in the district and state I came from. I came from the border of Himachal and Punjab, where my village was inside Himachal. Uh, we used to collect water from village well for school in the morning, and we drank that hot water all day long. <laughs> so the first project I started was, how do you get hundreds of schools with water coolers in these village schools that no one cares about water coolers? And we also used to have where a school, an elementary school may have only two rooms and the three classes. Where do the other yes. classes sit? Some sit under the tree and also getting some of these buildings and constructions kind of done. So I've done a number of projects in some of the areas that no one cares about. So many times say, hmm, lots of people get back to IITs. Very few people get back to areas that need the most. So let's focus yeah. on some of those areas. Has been one area of focus. But I think that the next bigger project I'm excited about is to follow Bill Gates' footsteps. I mean, he has done amazing stuff. Lots of people write a big check. The check goes through whoever and supposedly 10, 20 cents get it to the final destination. The rest of the stuff is overhead, so to speak. And Bill Gates runs his philanthropy as a really business. I mean, target results, gold. Uh, that gets me very excited. So my passion and my wife's passion is to see how we can change education. If in India, everyone could get the best education in terms of online, interactive, audio, video level of stuff. And, and then the need for figuring out the best of best schools actually could be really uh, changed and India could do a lot of stuff. So that's my next phase of journey. I'm getting ready, reading about some of the stuff and that's my next big dream. Fantastic. Uh, that, I can't wait for you to, to really get involved and make that even more successful than Zscaler because that will be yeah, yeah. your legacy. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, any other questions from our Indiaspora group uh, on here in the meetings? Uh, anybody else have a question? If not, I'm going to have, I think Sanjeev is waiting to ask a question. Sanjeev? Yes, that, yes that's right, Amar. Thank you. Uh, and this has been a terrific discussion with uh, Jay and Professor Sheikh covering a range of different subjects. Uh, and some very insightful thinking straight from the heart. Um, you know, uh, I'm going to ask a slightly provocative and deliberately contrarian question. Uh, yeah. There's been a lot of discussion today about how it's so important to learn from each other, how it's important to learn from different but adjacent disciplines in order to succeed. And needless to say, both Professor Shade and Jay have been remarkably successful in your in your own field. Um, but you know, the talk of the town nowadays is that you really need to have range, you need to have a breadth of different uh, experiences, you know, or, or uh, expertise, or, you know, be able to sort of compile together your insights from different areas to succeed in one area. Yes. And yet, the talk today has been about, you know, allying, let's say, marketing with business with industrial engineering, with scaling up companies, they're all somewhat adjacent fields. And so my question to both of you, one as a fabulously successful academic and the other as a tremendous you know, practitioner of scaling up companies is, you know, is it really true that you need that range and that breadth? I mean, how has, have you used a range of different expertise in your life to succeed and get where you are? Well, I, I totally agree with your fundamental assumption or axiom Ultimately, a good human being is always a deep generalist. They may be expert in one area, but they have knowledge, curiosity, information about all other areas. Their scanning of information is very eclectic, in other words. So they read religion on the one hand, they read science on the other hand, they read music on the third hand. So how do you become a deep generalist? Among several traits of great advisors, 
who are world-class advisors to public figures like presidents or to prime ministers of the country or to chairman of the large companies, they all tend to be deep generalists. They seem to know everything, little about everything. And the advantage of that kind of a deep generalist is that you connect the dots that nobody connected the dot. Because there was one dot here, another dot over here, and somehow you connected the dot and that gave a notion of, wow, ha, I never thought about it. And it keeps you going then. And then you become obsessed about creating new knowledge. So to me, that's the real skill set that can be learned or you have an aptitude for that. Now I'm a history major actually. My undergraduate was eclectic history, statistics and accounting. I was supposed to become a chartered accountant like typical Guju will become a chartered accountant. Right? <laughs> Never happened. Thank God it didn't happen. I would be so narrowly focused probably. But history has been the best subject for me. If there is any one subject that has more influenced me in my life has been history. And I love history of uh, biographies, not the events, but the person behind the event. What was it about the person? What made she or he involved in that situation? Whether you are an activist uh, leader like a Mahatma Gandhi and a, his history, or you are some monarch and his history, etc. So to me, history has been the foundational discipline. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Okay. Thanks, Jack. I would say, human beings are so different from each other. You can find 50 examples of kind A and 50 of B or 50 of C. So for me to say this kind of person succeeds and this doesn't, there's tons of contradictions. I think people succeed come from all kinds of backgrounds. They may be journalists, they may be highly specialized people. But the way I look at life is, you can't be too wide and too deep at the same time. It's hard. Yeah. Okay. So you need to pick areas. For me, also, people have more natural interests in certain areas more than others. All of us have certain interests. And I think discovering those passions, those interests, and going deeper in that area becomes a hobby, becomes fun, rather than work, so to speak. As, as a CEO, for example, I don't need to be good in all areas. I need to have a broad understanding of all disciplines, but I need to, I'm probably deep in other areas. I need to complement certain skills that I don't have with someone who is very good and very deeper at that. And then I'm learning about it, but I never try to do go as deep as uh, the expert will be, like the leader who runs our cloud operations and infrastructure. He needs to very deep, understand all the stuff because cloud has to run all the time. Do I need to get deeper? Yeah, to a certain level, but I don't need to really be that good at it. So I get good in certain areas and I leverage the skill set of others in other areas. It's a team that makes it happen. Without a great team, you never succeed in any aspect of life. All of us know about the teams and the success in sports, but in businesses, team is equally important. You must have a great team, just like players get moved in and out. You have to keep on moving your team, changing it, evolving it, because in addition to the expertise in certain areas, the scaling is very different. Lots of your leaders don't succeed beyond a certain level. They just can't evolve. Yeah. The way yeah. I look at business, I give them opportunities, but if they really don't go well, it's better for them to move out and someone to come in who feels better at it. Fantastic. Uh, I can't believe we've uh, spent an hour. <laughs> it just went by and it's been so engrossing. A couple of other comments. Uh, Jay Sagal on Facebook says, nice event uh, by in Diaspora. Thank you for organizing and bringing such prominent speakers to share their wisdom. Uh, Anand Deshpande says, uh, thank you for sharing your story and your passion. Uh, thank you in diaspora for organizing this session. So again, uh, you know, want to kind of close this session out. It's been truly inspiring and engaging. Maybe some final thoughts from each one of you to people listening and watching the, this show. Uh, some words of wisdom to uh, the next generation. Uh, that's what uh, we look for here is what's going to happen to the diaspora next. Uh, your children and our children and my children who are born here, 
uh, as uh, you know, first generation Americans, if you will, uh, what would you say, Professor Schiff, for the next generation? I think it's very important when they are growing up as children, almost at the infant age, to give positive messages about the country of origin. By the time they are teenagers, it's too late. They have to plant the idea that even though India may be a messy country, so diverse, so many things can happen. It doesn't have the hygiene that we have here, et cetera, et cetera. You have to give a positive message about the country of origin so they keep the legacy behind. Unlike what has happened to Indians settled in Africa, for example, after three generations, they've forgotten the motherland. So it's the responsibility of the parents to make sure there is a time where it has nothing, nothing to do with going to learn the religion or anything. I'm just talking about the values. Second thing is values of becoming independent. In other words, don't depend on the legacy of the person that you are born into or the family, but be on your own, create your own legacy, whatever you want to enjoy and have strong values. Ultimately, integrity matters. And unless it's built into you from the beginning, and especially as an entrepreneur, we all have the temptation to take, bypass the laws, temptation in fact to go around. You know, we are like a water, will find its way, but sometimes it may be necessary to have an integrity and a strength, as Jay mentioned. It's something that you are passionate about and that drives you. As I said, dislocations in life builds a character. We have taught our children to have a character of their own, which is the ultimate rock on which they can stand. And then do whatever you can do. And we have planted the idea that giving back is absolutely essential. The most meaningful you can do in life is to give back. Let me just add one comment. Making money without meaning is meaningless. People like us advise very successful entrepreneurs who are multi-billionaires, one on one one coaching, or large companies chairmen, they're empty inside. Because they never thought about giving back. They always want what the society can give you, but how they can get it rather than giving back. So they're very lonely at that stage of it. They don't know who to talk to. And I will, I'll make a blunt statement. Once the person isolates himself or herself from the ecosystem, I'm talking about contributing back. The society also isolates that person. Oh, this person is not able to give money back. He is, he's not interested. She's not in giving back. So to me, having that giving back aptitude or attitude can be cultivated very early in life, pretty much. So mm -hmm. those are the messages we give to our children. Yeah, and I just want to add to that. Uh, one of my billionaire friends who should be unnamed, his biggest regret was not becoming a philanthropist earlier in life. Yeah, you know, right. he could have done that at 20 or 30 <laughs> and he had right. to wait till he was older in life. So definitely yeah. that uh, resonates with people there as well. And Jay, the last word to you. Yeah, you know, the, the values I had tried to pass to my kids is the values <laughs> I believe in. And here's a basic philosophy. If you love your life, don't waste your time because that's the mm -hmm. stuff life is made of. So if you don't waste your time, what do you do? You do something to make a difference, right? Yeah. The life is too short. So we look at, I personally look at any of these things, whether I'm doing Cypher, Trust or Zscaler, we are trying to make the cloud the, a safe place to do business, to advance society. When COVID happened, only way people could work was work from home. So the most gratifying thing to me was that Zscaler enabled millions and millions of people to work from home remotely because of the security uh, service we offer. So it was extremely satisfying. I think our, our kids, right? One of the things they could learn, what immigrants actually know, all of us came and Jag alluded to the fact that adversity is wonderful, okay? It makes yeah. you a strong character. It really builds some good work ethics and values. That's what I have tried to induce in my, my kids have learned. And I think they learn it by watching. 
one of the things I wonder is when societies get rich, they all become lazy. A sense of entitlement comes in, right? They aren't really ready to go the extra mile. Uh, one of the number one reasons I like to hire immigrants is because whether they're from India or other countries, because they are actually willing to go the extra mile. They don't have that sense of entitlement. And a lot of people in India, my, my thousand plus employees in India, they actually all go the extra mile, which is good for them, which is good for us. I actually look at that as one way of giving back to society. I still recall in India, I would go there to hire these people. This one guy said, I like what Zskill is doing, but my dad wants me to work for IBM because he thinks that he will yeah. feel good about telling people that my son works for IBM and he'll get a better bride. It's like, come on, man. Okay. <laughs> All of this has to change. Uh, but I think core work ethics, integrity, honesty is really what drives all of us further. And we need to figure out how to keep inculcating that in our families and children. Can I add one thing? Uh, is it okay if I add oh, something, please, Jay? Please. Of course. Just to amplify. You know, if you take a grain of wheat and make it into a loaf of bread, agricultural commodity, yes. the value add is only about three times. Mm -hmm. If you take a rough diamond and a good diamond cutter polishes, gets the brilliance out, the market value goes up to about 15 times from rough diamond to a finished diamond. But if you take a human being, mentor, polish, educate, the value add is infinite. And that's what the strength of countries like India is all about. That's the hungriness of learning, investing. They just need some mentors who can provide that success or provide a formula. And that's what we do in all the charity work. If you look at it, there are brilliant set of school kids all the way into public schools in remote parts who are as good as we are. Our own background clearly tells. I mean, Jay grew up in a town of 800 people. I had a school where each bench was a separate school <laughs> grade. There was only one room house, pretty much. That's how I grew up. You know, it's very interesting. So thinking about where you were and when you are, you have a face validity that everybody has the potential. And as Jay mentioned, don't make them engineers and medical doctors, please. Let them decide and nurture whatever we do. That's the generation I grew up in. Today, there are too many choices out there for people to excel and let them excel as well with values ultimately. That's what it matters. And I'm sorry to give this last comment, but I'm very passionate about saying, investing in the child or a student, whether it's an undergraduate, a doctoral student, or a high school or a primary school is very key. Fantastic. On that very positive note, I want to close this uh, session. It's been fabulous, uh, Professor Sheth, to have you and your books. Uh, I encourage people to read your books uh, as well and also to look at some of your YouTube talks and such. And Jay, uh, wish you continued success at Zscaler. And we look forward to your work on education in the future. And thank you so much for both of you to spend uh, Saturday morning with us. And uh, this has been a great session for our members and the greater community as well. So once again, I want to thank you and uh, goodbye. And Mark, thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, same thing. Thank you. Bye, Jay.